Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. Man, it's been going crazy. Recorded on Saturday and Sunday, Monday, Tuesday popped off. 50 point performances. D Book has been going crazy. Um, Celtics Sixers has been back and forth. The Lakers are taking a commanding 3 1 oh, yeah. defending champs. Oh, yeah. Second round is heating up. As always, I'm Billy. I got my man Dame here with me. How we doing today, Dame? We good. We good <laughs> over here, bro. We good. I wore this specifically for this podcast, bro. We good over here. I'm doing great. Can't nothing ruin my day. <laughs> so I'm doing good. Yeah, man. Got to get the housekeeping out the way first, as always. Please be sure to like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Um, as always, our socials are in the description. Go and subscribe to those as well. Um, subscribe or follow to the follow the new TikTok channel that we've got. That's been getting some some good engagement over there on that platform. So, you know, like we said last time, we getting we diversifying the portfolio. You know, we getting it getting it getting it out the mud on, on every single platform. So, yes, sir. Sure to follow and subscribe on all of those, but. Let's just get right into it because it's been a wild three days of basketball. Um, we can really start anywhere, but I know exactly where you want to start, so we can we can go ahead and go right to the to the Lakers game. Um, I got a lot to say, a mm-hmm. lot to say, whole lot to say. And you know what? Go <laughs> just take the floor. They played twice. They played you know Saturday night after we recorded last time, mm-hmm. um, and then they played again on Tuesday night. Lakers took both of those games, so I'm gonna just give you the floor. How how we feeling now, Mister Mister Lakers fan? <laughs> so I, I'll I'll start with game two. Um, game two was good. Game two, three. Was, no, sorry. Yeah, yeah game three, three. Yeah. Game three. Game three was good. Um, like we talked about in the last pod, I was curious to see what adjustments Darvin and him was gonna make because we knew Steve Kerr was gonna come out and make adjustments. They switched up the starting lineup. I believe that was the game that they started Jermichael Green again. They mm-hmm. started him game two. <clears throat> excuse me. They started him game two. It had worked. They beat us by like 30 points. Yep. Then he started him again in game three. Um, but I like the adjustments that they made. Um, D'Lo had a great start. D'Lo, I'm, that was the game I believe he had 21 points in the first half. Um, and then that was the game I think Darvin Ham put Vando on Draymond instead of putting him on Steph, just so that when they run that pick and roll, he can end up switching it and playing it a little bit better. So, mm-hmm. like, I, I just – I like seeing when the coach at least tries something different. Don't just keep getting killed by the same things over and over and over again. I like that Darvin Ham switched that up and tried to give them a different look. That ended up working out. We won that game by 30 points. I believe we got good contributions from, like I said, D'Lo. Um, I'm pretty sure that was the game that uh, Schroeder had a good game. Um, it was balanced scoring pretty much all around. We knew AD was going to have a bounce back game. Every time he has a terrible performance, he comes back with a pretty good game. That's exactly what he did. Yep. So LeBron played well, and LeBron's been looking. He, I feel like he's been looking a lot better as far as just he has, his energy yeah. level, his health. Like his foot doesn't look like a problem. He doesn't look like an old man out there anymore. So I think he's getting healthier, like from that foot injury as time goes on. So that's really good to see. So like I said, it's not really much to talk about that game. We made adjustments. We came out. We knew. I knew we were going to win that game. I, there's no chance we we're going to lose game three. Game four was an interesting one because I knew that one was going to come down to the wire. So. A couple takeaways, like I said, Steve Kerr is going to make adjustments, came out, had Gary Payton Jr. in the starting mm-hmm. lineup. And honestly, at first, I was confused. Like, I hadn't – I didn't really see the vision. I'm like, you're just going to put – you're still going to have two non-shooters out there that we could sag off of. But what they did was we had Anthony Davis guarding Gary Payton. They wanted to put Anthony Davis in the pick and roll, and it was working pretty much all game. Like, mm-hmm. honestly, even in the second half, it was still working. We They just went away from it. I don't know what was their problem, but – it was working. They were getting wide open layups every yeah. single time. Um, so, yeah, that, that was their objective to get Anthony Davis away from the paint, get him in these pick and rolls. And it was, like I said, it was working a, a lot, a lot. But we came back. Um, LeBron had a good game. Uh, we got contributions from uh, from Austin Reeves. I believe he had like 21 points. So, honestly, I've always said this. We're going to get what we need to get from Anthony Davis. We're going to get what we need to get from LeBron. We just need between D'Lo and... Reeves, Rui, and probably Schroeder. I need at least two of those guys to have at least good, decent games. So, and that's exactly what we got. We got Gary Payton. Not sorry, not Gary Payton. We got Austin Reeves having a good game, and the go Lonnie Walker, <laughs> the, the greatest player ever, stepped up in the fourth quarter, 
Got all of his 15 points in the fourth quarter. Man, that, that was just crazy. Going yeah. from someone who completely out of the rotation to staying professional, knowing his number is going to be called eventually and, and just being ready for the moment, that was huge. And it's crazy because in game three, um, another one of Darvin Ham's adjustments was he didn't play any Troy Brown, which is good. I don't ever want to see him on the court ever again. <laughs> he didn't play any Troy Brown. He gave Lonnie Mo- Lonnie Walker some spot minutes, and I mm-hmm. thought he played very, very well in that yeah. game three when his number was called. So I, I, I definitely wanted to see more of him in game four, and that's exactly what happened. He saw Darvin Ham saw that he had the hot hand, rolled with him the whole fourth quarter. So, like I said, this these whole past two games. I, I, I like Darvin him a lot more. I already thought he was a, a good coach, especially for a first-year coach. I felt like he was getting way too much slack. But these past two games, I'm not going to say out-coaching Steve Kerr because I feel like it's more of our personnel is just better. I feel like Steve Kerr is trying things. I just think his guys aren't stepping up and they don't really have the personnel to compete oh. with our like our depth and stuff. So it, he's at least at the bare, bare minimum – Darvin Ham is matching Steve Kerr as far as as far as coaching, as far as making adjustments. So uh just listen, listen, we are we are three one, man. I feel great. I feel great right now. We're gonna get blown out tonight, but <laughs> we're gonna we gonna close it out in game six, man. Lakers is six. Yeah, uh I think I tweeted LeBron, Steph, a three one lead, man. What could go wrong? You know, like <laughs> we, yo, bro, if we lose, listen. We lose a three-one lead. I'm not doing this podcast no more. I'm good, bro. I'm straight. I'm not watching basketball. I'm done. I'm done, bro. Hey, we I, seen I the Warriors and Steph do it before. They that's how they got KD. Not Tim. We not KD. We not KD. We not OKC. We not KD. We not none of them, bro. It's different <laughs> over here. Um, but yeah, like you said, right? And, and we talked about it, you know, before the series even started. That there was gonna be a constant chess match between Steve Kerr and Darvin Ham. And we know what Steve Kerr always has. He always seems to push the right buttons, especially on all of these, you know, title runs that they've gone on in the past. Um, And so, you know, Darvin Ham really had a a lot on his plate and needed to step up to that challenge. And like you said, I think he's done a really excellent job to that point. Um, You know, with the GP2 adjustment of bringing him in, I think the thought process there was trying to basically eliminate one of these Laker guards from getting off. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and did a good job there in game four. I think D'Lo, um, game he four, had, bad. yeah, he did not have a good game. He got one or two field goals. Mm-hmm. Um, so to, to that point, you know, that was effective there. Um, I saw, you know, Draymond was on his podcast saying like at the end of the day, right. If Lonnie Walker is the guy that's beating you, like your defensive coverage worked, you know, you just got to tip your cap to an extent. And, like you mm-hmm. said, in game three, you know, Lonnie Walker played some of those spot minutes. I thought he looked good there, brought some good energy off the bench. Um, was happy to see that his number got tabbed again for game four and then just lit it up <laughs> in the fourth quarter. All 15 of his points coming in the last period. It's crazy, crazy to see. And, you know, credit has to go to LeBron here. I see he's done his whole career, right? Like, somebody's got it going, especially now as he's gotten up there in age and starting to see more in this playoffs him playing like an off ball role he's finding Lonnie on you know <laughs> coming off of pin downs coming off of screens he's giving it to him and getting out the way letting him operate um a big thing in this game especially in the fourth quarter the Lakers were hunting Steph Curry whether that was to score or for dribble penetration for LeBron one way or another they were running multiple on ball screens to get the the Steph Curry as the primary defender on the ball and operating from there. So a lot of that led to LeBron James posting him up, getting deep into the paint and making a kick out pass from there or getting the ball into Lonnie Walker's hands, who scored over Steph three or four times in that quarter. A couple of tough jumpers, some floaters. Um, So that I think additionally may have even contributed to what we saw in that end sequence where, um, you know, that last shot that Steph took to, to try to take the lead there honestly did not need to shoot that shot in that situation. He had time on the shot clock. Again, it's a little bit different from Jordan Poole, right? That <laughs> that leash is a lot longer. Right. Um, You're going to live with that of, shot from Steph. Right. Because, again, if he makes it, I don't, no, I, I'm not even saying this because it's Steph, right? right? But at the end of the day, he definitely had more time to operate. Could have, you know, 
taking a chance to take AD off the dribble. But again, got to give credit to AD, did his best Kevin Love impersonation, got out on the perimeter and sat in the chair for two possessions against the best shooter in the world and got two misses. So, um, man, this Lakers team, like, again, got to give a ton of credit to Darvin Ham for uh, just the small adjustments that he's made. Um, again, playing that chess match with Steve Kerr in a game-by-game -game basis, making those adjustments um, on the fly, um, you know, pushing the right buttons there, inserting different guys into the rotation as needed. Um, so huge, huge win for the Lakers there. Um, and, you know, like you said, right, the, the pick and roll by the Warriors have been really effective in the first half of getting AD out of the paint. I think they had 20, 20 or 21 points in the paint in the first quarter. Um, mm -hmm. which is not how the Warriors play at all. Um, don't know why they really went away from that action in the second half as much because um, it seemed like it was a free bucket for them almost every time. That hurts. Um, and again, to your point, right, this Lakers team is – or not the Lakers, this Warriors team is not – doesn't have the same personnel like they've had on their past title runs. And again, as much of the benefit of the doubt that we want to give them because – it's the Warriors dynasty, the defending champs. The writing was on the wall in the regular season for who this team was, right? You won, was it seven or nine games on the road the whole year? There was always a decent amount of inconsistent play from a lot of their top players. Wiggins had, you know, the personal matters, which had him miss a decent amount of time. So there was a lot of issues that never got addressed. They never really got in a great rhythm even to end the season. Um, and it's showing here. Um, where, you know, it's the second game in a row. I think Clay Thompson is, you know, three for nine from three. He's kind of been a non-factor on offense for these last two games. And it's really like, Steph, what can you do for us? And when you're trying to put that much of a superhero effort on your, your best player, that's not usually a recipe for success. Um, so, again, ton of credit to Darvin Ham, ton of credit to – um, you know, Lakers team as a whole. And again, the Lonnie Walker game um, was huge. And the Lakers take a 3-1 series lead and are one game away from the Western Conference Finals after starting the season 2-10. We were the 13th seed, Billy. 13th seed, bro. People count. And this is why, like, bro, this this run is going to feel so good, bro. Because I know there, there was a, a good amount of people that picked the Lakers, but I also was a lot of people in the media that picked the Warriors. I still see, like, even, like, the day after the game, I still see people saying, oh, yeah, I think the Warriors team is just better. They're just not playing good. I'm like, what are we talking about right now? I saw a take. I saw a take from Rick Buecher. He said, if the Warriors played more efficient, they'd be the better team. I'm like, what, like, what do – if I was 6'9 and could jump out the gym, I'd be right. LeBron. Like, what are right. we talking about right now? That's like, what I'm saying, though. People want to give so much benefit of the doubt to them because it's the Warriors. But, right. like, the eyes don't lie. If you've watched this team all season, you've seen inconsistent play on the road. You've seen inconsistent play from some of their top players. You've seen a regression from Jordan Poole, um, who didn't score in this game. 0 for 4 from the field. He only played 10 minutes. He needs more minutes. Play him. He needs more minutes. <laughs> it's wild how he was a a big contributor for them on their, you know, run. Obviously, he still had his issues last year in their finals run, but he looks unplayable right now for this Warriors team, which, again, hurts in a situation where Steph has so much pressure on him to be the entire offense because his play shot isn't dropping. The, the Warriors are letting Wiggins shoot. Wiggins' shot isn't dropping. So, again, it's like, Steph, can you save us? It would be mm -hmm. real nice if you had a pool party to help him out. Um, right. So, like, th I don't know where <laughs> everything went wrong there. I don't know if it's, you know, off the course stuff of what happened, you know, with Draymond and that whole incident. But this has been a – I'm like, even in the first round, I was, you know, shocked at – how much of a regression it seemed like he took and how bad his minutes looked, but they've looked even worse in the second round series to me. And maybe that's just the stakes being higher. Maybe it's just the Lakers being a better team, but um, you know, that's hindering them, you know, even more. And so, yeah, to your point, like you, you can't 
give this team the benefit of the doubt this many times, right? Like they are one game away from being eliminated. So mm-hmm. you can't just say like, they're just going to turn it on. They're just going to, they, they haven't. And like, if they do credit to them, like that would be wild, but I just don't see a way for the Warriors to win this series. Like if they were able to rattle off three straight, we would need to see multiple insane Steph games back to back to back. And I just don't see that happening with how locked in the Lakers have been defensively. Even on that that last possession there where they were looking to get uh, Clay in the corner running that, you know, hammer action, which is, you know, for people that aren't, you know, completely sure what that is. You know, they're running an on-ball screen for Draymond to get him into the paint while at the same time running an off-ball screen to get Clay into the opposite side corner to get a nice little dribble drive and kind of, you know, kick out action. And the Lakers switched everything perfectly. Like, very little communication. It seemed like you know, verbally on the court, but everything was done perfectly. Switched the screen perfectly, dropped into the, you know, the drop coverage there for Draymond, got him contested in the paint. And at the same time, the two people guarding the off-ball screen got AD dropped into the corner, smothering Clay on that. Draymond left his feet and just immediately turned the ball over in the corner, threw it right to AD. So, again, huge credit to the Lakers team, credit to Darvin Ham. Um yeah, they have been locked in defensively and definitely up to the task of of trying to stop this Warriors offense and have been giving them fits. Yeah, it's um it's funny too because you talked about how this isn't the same Warriors team from the past. I also feel like the Warriors themselves are kind of living in the past a little bit because they've always been a we turn the ball over a lot, we shoot a lot of threes, we run up and down type of team. But what has bailed them out all the time is the fact that they're Always been the best shooting team in the league, and they've been a great defensive team. Clay used to be a legit two way player, so when he takes those terrible threes that like he took before, it's okay because one, you know, he's not going to get shaken by that. He's going to come back. He's going to keep shooting, and he's going to bring that along with elite level defense on the other end. So he could shoot that three and then go get you a stop on the other end. But like mm-hmm. right now, the defense is not there. The team as a whole is just. It's not the same team. They keep living in the past, keep doing the same mistakes, but does don't have the same amount of leeway as they did in the past. So, I mean, Steph is still the same. Steph is arguably better, I feel like, than he I would was. Say so, yeah. I, it's like Steph is at a whole different level. I feel like Steph is playing <clears> – <throat> right now, Steph is playing like a perfect point guard right now. Like he had a triple-double in game, game four, five, four? Four. In game four. Yeah, he had a triple double playing like he's playing the perfect point guard right now. Besides that, that last minute of the game, like he's virtually, like we said, carrying this team. But the supporting cast just isn't up for it, especially on the road. You could definitely tell there's a difference between the way these supporting cast players play on the road versus at home. Mm-hmm. But that's something we could have predicted. Like you said, they won nine road games. Like, yep. bro, the writing's been on the wall for this team. But it's like, like you said, like people just rely on the fact that they're the dynasty. They've won four championships out of four championships out of the past eight years, which is I understand the experience and all that. I, I get it. That's the reason I picked them against the Kings, but against a good team, a good overall team with great defense, great defense, great depth, other star power. I just I don't I never saw a world where they they beat us. Honestly, like even being completely unbiased, I would I, if I wasn't a Lakers fan, I would have picked the Lakers to beat this team. Yeah, um, and. You know, we can get into this after there's the series ends and, you know, if it trends the way that it's going and the Warriors are eliminated, right? Like, they have some real big decisions to make this yes. offseason just with, you know, Draymond being up for a new contract and then the looming, what they call it the salary curtain now where it's essentially even greater, you know, punishment if you're over that, you know, luxury tax threshold, which the Warriors you know, have been in for so long, especially coming out of those KD years. Mm-hmm. Um, so they've got a lot of decisions to make. I've heard people saying that they need to get off of Jordan Poole now while he has some value mm-hmm. and not let it get worse because he's going to be a $30 million player next year. Um, and that's only going to keep getting higher over the next couple of years. Yeah. Um, and to be a $30 million player and unplayable unplayable in the playoffs. That could turn into, like, one of the worst contracts, like, like in recent years. It's crazy because I think Jordan Poole is a good player. Like I, still, I do, too. I don't, I don't think he's a bad player. I think that 
I feel like he sees Steph run around, shoot all these threes, play so loose with the ball. Like he's like, all right, I'm just Steph Jr. Like, and that's kind of what they paid him to be. Like when he had his good year, like they were like, okay, this is another splash brother. Like this is another person that we can run around. He shoots a bunch of threes. <laughs> You know, now he's getting flashy. shunned from the family, like <laughs> exactly. Like they kind of paid him to be this way, so I just feel like I don't think he's a bad player. I wouldn't really give up on him. Maybe the Warriors have to move off of him. I don't know, but I like as a player, as far as like looking at him as in NBA terms, I feel like he's a solid player. He just needs a little bit more structure around him and needs to play the right way, not this I'm trying to be Steph Junior type of way. Yeah, he definitely needs to slow down. So much of his right. issues come in just like – it feels like everything needs to be a crazy shake and bake highlight. Right. It doesn't – it does not need to do that. And then He'll get in the game and then shoot a, and shoot like a 30-footer and then run, throw the ball out of that. I'm like, bro, just calm down. <laughs> Please just slow – he plays the game like, like a Pop Warner kid, bro. Just calm <laughs> down. Yeah, so – you know, we'll, we'll get into it in a later episode, but again, a lot of decisions for the Warriors coming up in this offseason. I don't know if trading Jordan Poole is an option. I don't know what they're going to do with Draymond Green. They're going to have to retool this cast around, you know, Steph for sure, because again, if they lose this series is the way that it's trending. Um, it's, Steph has nothing to, no, no blame really I would put on him. And like you said, I think that he's shown like, with the coverages that they're giving him, he's been able to score in bunches. And when that hasn't been there, he's been able to efficiently facilitate the ball to get points. So he's doing everything right. He's making the right decisions. He's going to have an off shooting night here and there. Everybody does. So like this game, he shot, you know, less than 50% from the field, three for 14 from three happens when you take that many threes, eventually like there's going to be games where they don't fall. Um, but triple double out of Steph Curry in a game four. Like these are, he's doing everything he can. The others are failing him as they have for a lot of this season. Um, and for even their previous series against the Kings, you saw it took a 50 point performance out of him to win the game seven. So look, the Lakers are not the Kings and that's not a slight to them, but it's just a different echelon and how they were able to get out of that series is not, working here for them so look they're they're playing the inevitable nba champs like it's okay it's okay to lose to the champs man. what you got to say to clippers fans right now how is cancun how is cancun (laughs) how does it feel to be home yes y'all beat us 11 straight times that's cute that's fine hang the banner bro hang the banner of y'all beating the lakers 11 straight times while we hang the banner of two championships in the lebron era bro come on bro like bro i hate clippers fans i really hate clippers fans because they're they're the main ones that won one wanted to discredit the bubble championship that they blew a three one lead in, and that Kawhi and Paul George played like trash in that game seven down the stretch, and they would just want to like they want to like live in the fact that they like honestly I'm be honest we can't beat them I don't know what it is we cannot beat them that's cute that's fine I don't need to beat y'all because y'all <laughs> never gonna play us in the playoffs so y'all always gonna be hurt bro it doesn't matter y'all can't we can't beat y'all fine y'all can't stay healthy it is what it is so. Them and Warriors fans piss me off. I'm be honest. Like this series, I I like the Warriors. I like Steph. I'm a huge Steph fan. I actually really like the Warriors. But this playoff series, man, bro, these Warrior fans are ridiculous, bro. Like if it's not one thing, it's another. Like if we, bro, they really believe that like we're only winning because we get to the free throw line, and that's it. And they're so confused as to why we get to the free throw line so much and they don't. Bro, y'all are. A jump shooting team, yeah, gets to the free throw line the least in the NBA. This was in the regular season, like yeah. the, the least in the NBA. Yeah, foul one of the most in the NBA. Yeah, we we shoot the most free throws. We foul the least. Like that combo <laughs> just results in us shooting twenty more free throws than y'all game. Like, what? I don't get it. It's like right. these people don't watch the games. Like they just look at the box score and they'd be like, "Oh yeah, we're getting cheated." Like, y'all don't actually watch what's going on. I even seen a tweet that was like, cause like we talked about how they had a lot of paint, a lot of paint points in the first half or in the first quarter of that mm-hmm. game. And I seen a tweet like midway through the game, like, where oh, the free okay. throws probably. Where the free throws at? I'm like, bro, y'all are getting wide open layouts. What you, where's right, the y'all, are pulling, y'all are pulling who could foul you out of the paint. It's exactly. the whole way that the scheme is working. 
Is that um, y'all are playing well? You're getting yeah. wide open layers. Like, you, what do you need free throws for? Like, what actually watch the games and you would see what goes on. Like, it all makes sense when you watch the games. And I would say this is one of a series that if you're just a box score or a box score watcher, it would kind of confuse you a little bit. Like, especially like game one, they had like 45 more points than us off of threes. If you just look at the box score, like they look like they should have won that game. But like, I, you have to actually watch the games and see what's going on to get the full picture of it. So. Yeah, Warriors fans kind of pissed me off a little bit. Clippers fans, I hope y'all enjoy vacation. I hope it's nice over there. I hope the weather's great. We're going to be winning a chip, man. That's all I got to uh, say. We got to make that a TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, like, even watching the, the Lakers play, like you said, right, their, their drives are always going through contact into people. Do they embellish the contact? Yes, but – so does so much of the league. Like, that's kind of just a reality of NBA today. But Austin Reeves is getting hit on the arm. You know, Schroeder's getting hit. LeBron's getting hit. AD's getting hit. It's like they're always seeking out contact when they're going downhill. So That's our game. That's, what, that's how right. we play. And I don't want yeah. to hear no excuse about, like, oh, we're flop. Because I've seen Steve Kerr was like, oh, we got a couple flops on the legal screen. I'm like, bro, I watched Draymond pass block every single possession. And then you think I want to – you think I care about – us flopping around a legal screen. If we don't exaggerate a little bit, you're never gonna call it, bro. I but there's a clip. I wish I could put it in the podcast. I'll probably if we make this a clip, I'll put it in and I'll put it in there. There is a clip of Kavon Looney setting a screen on Clay Thompson. Mind you, he never he never stopped moving his feet. Bro, mind you, AD played it terribly. Like it is what it is. When I this dude did not stop moving, bro. He just kept backpedaling and backpedaling. I'm like, bro, what is this? How are we playing against this? How is this legal, bro? How is this not being called? They've been doing it for years, the whole time. I, there's got to be a crazy compilation of just like Looney, Draymond Green. It probably could go back to guys like David Weston, David, Bogut, yeah, like exactly. way back. Just illegal screens that were not called. Bro, it is ridiculous, bro. They get like, I just feel like the Warriors just get babied and like, I just I think it's it the is. sheer volume of how many screens they set. Like, the, the refs literally cannot – they're, like, putting it in their hands to make that call, and they're not going to make every single one. So they're going to get away with, with more rather than not. The same way that the Lakers are driving way more than them in the contact and putting it into their hands to make the call. So eventually they're going to get some and works in reverse order, right? Like, you're setting mm-hmm. so many screens, the refs aren't going to call every single one that's a little bit – I didn't really, you know, he, he stuck his arm out, he stuck his leg out, he didn't really set his feet. Like, yeah, I don't want to call every single ticky tack one, especially in the playoffs. But yeah, I need the egregious ones called though. Like the loony one, that was ridiculous. I need those called. I'm sorry, I can't have dudes out here pass blocking. Like, how are we supposed to defend that? Steve Kerr saying that is crazy to me because I, I know he knows. I know you know. Yeah. Everybody knows. They all know. They they all know, and they're doing it on purpose because they know they can get away with it. Yeah, like they're not dumb. The Warriors are a very smart team. They know what they're doing. Game uh game five is the night, right? Yep. So chance we're to close it out on Golden State. Yeah, I don't think it's gonna happen. But <laughs> no, we're good. There, there's no chance we win this game. Like not yeah. at all. We're gonna lose this game, and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna throttle them in game six. Yeah. So that's a. It's going to be interesting to see how that one finishes out. So like I said, 3-1 series lead, man. Never is, ain't safe around LeBron, but it ain't safe around Steph either. So you're going to have to send them boys home. Bro, I'll go guard Steph myself if I got to. Just let me know, Darvin. Just let how me many know. minutes you got before you fouling out guarding Steph? Guarding Steph? Bro, I like – I'm talking I, about they they putting you on an island. Like, if they send a screen, like, they come in, they hedge him, but, like, it's you. Oh, no, I'm definitely fouling out. I'm either fouling out or I'm passing out, bro. Steph run too much, bro. <laughs> like, I can't. I'm not chasing Steph around all game, bro. I don't think I can do that. That's tough. Yeah, he. Uh, I'm not giving it up easy though. I'm hacking him. I'm, you're gonna have to, bro, because it's, it's no way. Know. It's too too high energy. So, uh, let's move on to to a series out east that has not gone the way that. I expected it to before we started the series. Um, the Heat are also up 3-1 now um, on the Knicks. The last two games from for New York have been tough to watch, 
Um, I would imagine as a Knicks fan, I've seen Knicks fans complaining about the effort of their team, which I think more so in game four was the real determining factor in that game, especially in the fourth quarter. There were, I think there was a point halfway through the quarter, the Knicks had six or seven, or not the Knicks, the Heat had six or seven offensive rebounds. There was a possession where they got four shots up, and it felt like the possession took like a minute and a half. Mm -hmm. It's just like every single rebound felt like a backbreaker because the Knicks were in the game every single time, and they just can't box out. And it's everybody crashing the glass. I'm seeing – Bam get offensive rebounds. Jimmy get one. Kyle Lowry's crashing in from the three-point line and getting an offensive rebound. Um, so that is is unacceptable for this Knicks team that coming out of the first round was viewed as this, you know, scrappy, gritty, hard-working team. They took it to the Cavs. They were more physical than them. And then it's like they walked up to a bigger dog. And now they, they don't got no bark to them anymore. Um, All right. The, the Heat have done a phenomenal job defensively on packing the paint, um, basically almost effectively taking Julius Randle out of this series. I, his shooting splits for the playoffs, I think, are really rough. Um, yeah, he's down basically 10% from the field um, this, since the from the regular season, down 11% um, from the postseason. I know if we're looking at just this series, those are probably even lower. Um, so he's been shooting worse across the board, even at the free throw line. Um, and I think he's averaging 10 less points per game in the postseason than he was in the regular season. Um, so, you know, they've done a great job at, at eliminating him, trying to make it all on, you know, on Brunson to try to you know shoulder the offensive low for this team. Um, and the others are not knocking down their shots. Um, that's been a huge issue for them. Um you know, Josh Hart struggled from shooting lot, struggled, struggled shooting from three last game. Uh, Emmanuel quickly has been a non-factor for them in most of the playoffs. Um, I know we gave credit to, to Tibbs in the first round and, you know, being even spread with the minutes and trying to bring different guys off the bench. Have to be critical when it's, you know, when it's here, those same guys not right. performing. And he does have two vets on the bench, mm -hmm. not seeing the floor who both can shoot, one of them a shooter. Right. And they can't get any minutes at all while quickly is coming in and shooting bad. Cute, you know, Quinn Grimes is not shooting well. Tobin's not shooting well. Josh Hart's not shooting well. What do you have to lose? Because if you lose that game, right, you're down 3-1. Like, that's typically, a, you know, like that's the end of your series more often than not. Probably, I imagine, upwards of 75 80%. Mm -hmm. Um so wish you would have the opportunity to, you know, give those guys a chance to showcase something because you have Eric Spolster over here <laughs> playing Hayward Highsmith. And, like, he just always feels like he pushes the right buttons. I think he's easily been the best coach this entire playoffs again, just with how much he's able to do with minimal resources and missing Tyler Hero. Um he has this team playing phenomenally. Um, I think game four was one of the best games I've seen out of BAM from an offensive perspective, probably this whole postseason. But, um, you know, even just in a while, I feel like he definitely was more aggressive than I've seen from him early. I think he finished with 20-plus points, 23, 23, 10, and 2 um, with a steal as well. So, um, you know, we know what we're going to get from Jimmy – you know, if Bam is stepping up, Struess is stepping up, Gabe Vincent is stepping up, and just you know, some of the other shooters and guys coming off this bench are stepping up. Um, this Heat team is a tough out on any night, um, and they are taking it to this Knicks team. And again, I have to say, like I said multiple times on here before, this team was down by two with three minutes to go on the Chicago Bulls in the last game of the playing tournament. And they are one win away from the Eastern Conference finals that's insane <laughs> that is so crazy man that is just uh that is so wild but yeah um I can't agree more with anything you said um it just seems like the Knicks right now are getting beat at their own game like you said they're getting out hustled yep. they're getting outworked they're like that he are playing better defense it's like they're playing more as a team and that is 
the whole Knicks mission statement right now. That's that's what they're supposed to be doing, and they're just getting outworked. Um, it's crazy, bro. Eric Spoelstra is the goat, bro. Eric Spoelstra is, bro. He could have me and you out there playing effective minutes, helping Jimmy Butler win, bro. It is. <laughs> I swear, bro. It is ridiculous, bro. And like you said, and on the other hand, it's for me. I would be frustrated as a Knicks fan due to the lack of just trying different things. It's, Due to the lack of just trying new stuff out, especially in a game where, like you said, you lose this game, you go down 3-1, the series is basically over. I would at least try different stuff, especially when your bench isn't giving you much production. Like, Emmanuel quickly, he was hurt last game, didn't even play. But even when he was playing, he's giving you nothing. Like, I understand he was a runner-up six man, but it's like, not to go back to the Lakers series, but D'Lo gave us nothing. You didn't see him in the fourth quarter, or like barely any in the fourth right. quarter. Like, if you're not playing well, this is the playoffs. Like, we don't have time to like, care about your feelings. We don't have time to play off your name and reputation. We need to go off of who's going to help us win this basketball mm-hmm. game. I get so, it when in the regular season when he, he basically gave him the, the backup point guard role and, you know, told Derrick Rose, like, we're kind of phasing out of the rotation. Fair, mm-hmm. right? You let the young guy develop. This isn't time for development. This is time right. to win. Right. Yeah. So, it's like, I just need you to try different stuff out. Like, you've seen what happened with Lonnie Walker. Like, I mean, just try stuff. You don't know what – Derrick Rose can come in and give you that spark off the bench that you need and they can get this team going. So, I just – it's the lack of adjustments is frustrating if I was a Knicks fan. Um, like I said, Julius Randle is just not a playoff performer, it seems like. like he, His body language sucks, bro. Yeah, and it's like, bro, there's certain plays where, like, he'll turn the ball over or someone will turn on the ball over. He's not getting back on defense. He's visibly throwing his arms up. He's frustrated. Like – yeah, he's always know. arguing with the re- – it feels like when it rains, it pours with him. Like, mm-hmm. I don't feel like I ever see him – like, his highs don't get crazy high, like, from an emotional standpoint on the court, which is fine. But when he's down, bro, it is like – you get it impacts his whole play. It feels like his hustle drops. You see him argue, pause with refs like crazy. Mm-hmm. It just feels like he's, like, moping on the court. Um, and you see it in his post-game press. They're asking him about effort. And he's like, I, I don't know that he just wanted more. How does it look as a star player to say that? You're not supposed like, to say that. Like in I mean, context, out of context, those like you cannot be saying that unless it's like a like a for real criticism of how y'all are playing as a whole. And it's not how he's saying it because he's just saying, you know, I don't know. I, I guess the Heat just wanted more than us. That's, that's got to be it. Like it's like he just doesn't care. Effort like, is something you control regardless of your skill set, your talent, right? Like. There are guys in the league who are visibly less talented, less skilled, genetically, athletically, whatever, but night in, night out are going to give you ridiculous amounts of effort like Jimmy Butler is doing on a bad ankle right now. Right. So, yeah, that that quote really blew me to to just read because – or even listen to the, the presser because, you know, you're supposed to be the guy here in New York um, and this is not the first time that this kind of stuff has happened with him. You know, like he's had these, you know, effort issues, you know, moping type cases that he's just been down and out on the court before. Um, and I know it's got to be frustrating for Knicks fans for sure. So, uh, yeah, the Knicks are one game away from elimination. They look like this was a time for them to completely lock in. You have the Bucks out of the playoffs, a chance to go against a hobbled Heat team to get to the Eastern Conference Finals. And a playoffs where, you know, me and you included and a lot of other people didn't have them coming out of the first round against what seemed like a, you know, more talented Cavs team. Um, like I said, to your point, they're just getting out-hustled, out-worked. Um, the, the defense by Miami has been, been smothering them. Um, as Miami always really seems to, to do in the playoffs. So tough, tough break for the Knicks here. I don't – again, we can – we'll probably go into larger detail with some of the offseason decisions that a lot of these, you know, playoff teams have to make. But, again, I, I'd imagine that there can't be too many straws left here with Julius Randle. Like, some has got to give. And, and what we've seen from R.J. Barrett, I definitely say it's a step up from, you know – Last last time they were in the playoffs and just for the last few seasons as a whole, I feel like we're starting to see him get more efficient and really be more of a presence on the, the offensive side of the ball. So I'm not saying that necessarily makes Julius Randle more expendable, but 
something's got to change. And they have a lot of, you know, assets. Obviously, they traded their pick um, this from this past year to the Thunder. So they have extra draft capital. They have young guys in Obi Toppin and, you know, QG, Miles McBride, um, Emmanuel Quickly, whatever, if they wanted to try to make a play at, you know, consolidating and getting a trade piece um, to bring in a different guy or, a, you know, a potential, you know, second star type player maybe to New York. Um, so, you know, another team that, you know, if it's trending the way that it is and is out here in, you know, game five or six, um, that they will be, uh, again, another team with a lot of decisions to make this offseason. Yeah, 100%. Like you said, we can get more into it probably because – uh, they could lose in five. The way they're playing, just the way their demeanor, yeah. they they can – like the Warriors, I feel like they will come back, but I, th- I think they'll inevitably lose in six. But the Knicks could be up out of here in five games. So, like I said, next podcast, they should be eliminated by then. We can get more deep into what they should do in the future. But, yeah, um, it's, it's tough right now. It's funny because, like you said, with the Cavs team, you can argue they had more cap, they had more talent, but the Knicks just outworked them, out hustled them. They wanted it more. They're the grittier team, and it's the same thing right now. I, you could still argue the Knicks have more talent, like, but the Heat just they want it more. They're better coach. They're outworking you. Their best player has been the best player on the floor. Your best player, well, arguably your best player has been a shell of himself in the playoffs. So, yeah, it's it's tough for the Knicks right now. Yeah. Staying in, staying in the East, we'll get to the, the Celtics Sixer series. I know on uh, Saturday's pod, we said, you know, we're out here, we're looking for James Harden, we can't find him. He pulled up. He, he found he us. Definitely pulled up. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, I don't know what changed. Between, I think he said Doc Rivers sent him a gospel song. Um, <laughs> Whatever works. Whatever works. Um, and I forgot what it was called. Something like, you know, my name or what's my name, something like that. Um, and he said he played it before the game. And he just was like, Doc, I don't really get it. But, you know, I get the message. I get what you're trying to say. And he reminded everybody that this is who James Harden can be. Um, so he put up 42 on 16 of 23 shooting. Um in game four, which was a huge game for them, you know, in Philly um, to get the split there as they had already gotten the split in, in Boston and basically get, you know, um, you know, go back to Boston for game five, you know, the even split series. Um, Harda had 42. Joel had 34 on 12 of 15 from the free throw line. Um, and so they really took this game over and down the stretch, the Celtics had multiple opportunities in game four to tie the game, win the game. I think they had two different shots for Marcus Smart, which could have won the game. Um, and the one in overtime really crushed me because they got it across half court with, with like 14, 13 seconds to go and don't even get into their action um, until there's five seconds left on the clock. And he makes the shot where if you start that, even a second sooner, right? Like that may count. And this is a three, one series instead of a a two, two series. Um, Mm -hmm. So just bad play down the stretch there for the Celtics. Um, I don't think Jalen Brown got a shot attempt in in overtime at all, which has kind of been a theme. Even when we get into, you know, we talk about game five of the series too. feels like he had, he has these dominant starts to games. Him and Tatum feel like flipped. Right. Tatum, Tatum starts a lot of say. these games mm-hmm. so slow, which, again, you finish fourth in MVP voting. That can't happen, right? You cannot have this many games in a row where you're coming out 0 of 8, 0 for 5. You didn't score in the first quarter. Like Jalen Brown feels like the opposite. He'll get it going early and then disappear, doesn't get shots. So I, it's – I don't even want to give them, you know, saying that they're young still because – we talked about it earlier, right? Like they've been in the playoffs since their rookie year. They were at the, they were in the finals last year. Y'all have got to find a way to, to get it, make it work and be more efficient. I don't want to put all of the onus on Joe Missoula as a coach. Cause I think there's some things that he's could be doing differently um, that, you know, can maybe have more of an impact on the series. But at the end of the day, y'all have been in these situations before. This is not fully coaching. Like, the set was called. It shouldn't take this long for you to get into your offense. 
it shouldn't be an issue to get Jalen Brown the ball. Jason Tatum cannot be starting slug. These are this has nothing to do with Missoula, right? Mm-hmm. Like those specific issues aside, um, like this is an on the court thing for for the Celtics that um, is hurting them because again we're going to look at Game Five here. Um, they are now down three two in the series, going to Philly now for Game Six with a chance to get eliminated. Um, Again, and they started. They they dropped the one game that Embiid was out in this series, and since he that's why that was back, such a bad loss. That bad that loss was terrible. Yeah, and, and since he's been back, um, he's been great. Um, and, and Harden has had you know these last two games has been really good. Really responded from the the two games that he really was a non factor in, in in game two and game three. Um, you know, Tatum got it going here late in this game, but. A lot of that was kind of when the game was well out of reach. The Sixers, it felt like watching it that the Celtics were always kind of within striking distance, and it felt like they would rattle off, you know, five, six, seven points, and then Max would come down, lace another three, lace mm-hmm. another three. And, like, they never let the Sixers – or never let the Celtics really close the gap deep enough for the Sixers to get really concerned. Um, and uh, they just – they just look like the, the better team. They look like the more poised team. Um, almost once they also look like the more veteran team. If they just um, have been making better decisions, they've been making better shots. Derek White has not had a huge impact on this series, in my opinion, which is also hurting the Celtics. Um, but, yeah, another, like, rough shooting night also from Horford in this game. So, like, there's so many small factors from an individual player basis for this, this Celtics team that – as a whole has hurt them this entire series and now is putting them on the brink of elimination, um, you know, just a year removed from a finals run um, against Golden State. Yeah. Um, when I watch these games, it seems like, like you said, Tatum gets off to a very slow start. And it's weird because it seems like he's kind of forcing himself to get it going, which, I mean, I guess I credit you for staying aggressive, but, I don't know if that plays into Jalen Brown not being more involved into the offense later into the game because, like, these games he'll start off with, like, 12 points in the first quarter, 10 points in the first quarter, something like that, and he'll end with 23, which isn't bad, but it's like you get off to a 12-point first quarter, I feel like you should have – that's your setup for, like, a 30-point game, like a really mm-hmm. big game, and it seems like later into the game, like, he's just not getting looks. He's not getting the shots up. It's just – it seems like it's just a Tatum show, which I don't know if that – Part of it is just the way the offense is run. I don't know if it's the coaching. I'm not sure. I'm just speculating at this point. But, uh, yeah, like you said, Tatum ha- has to stop getting out to these slow starts. Like, you're supposed to be a superstar. You're supposed to be the best player on this team, on the championship team, championship level team. You cannot be getting out to these slow starts, especially against a good team in the Sixers. So, I don't know. I don't know what they do in that aspect, but they need to find a way to get these two going at the same time. Like, right now, it just seems like if one of them has it going, the other one, has to just take a back seat. Which, yeah. Like, that's not going to win. That's not the recipe for success. You guys are supposed to be a duo, not just your turn, my turn, your turn, my turn. Right. It feels like a lot of the times when they need a bucket, it feels like there's no two-man game between the two of them. It's mm-hmm. here, score, or you, here, JB, you score, right? Like, there's no mm-hmm. – and that, again, hurts the flow of the two of them, which is why it's felt like this whole series needs – they don't have games where both of them are getting it going at the same time. And, and when they have had games like that in the past is when the Celtics have been at their best because you have two wing scorers who, again, are, are a tough matchup, especially Tatum with his length and, and a you know, skill set ability to handle the ball, get to the rack, three-level score, like all of those tools in his, you know, his bag there. Um, it hurts that the both of them can't get it going at the same time. So I know it's been the topic of discussion for this team for years now, like how the two of them continue to coexist. I don't think I, – I will never think breaking it up is going to be their issue at this point. Like they just need to continue to figure out an offense where the both of them are able to thrive at the same time because it cannot continue to be this, you know, here you go, Tatum, like you're going to try to do this post-up, this mid-range, you know, try to get these floaters at the basket. I think he could also drive more than he does. I think he probably settles – for, you know, kind of working in the mid range and shooting a lot of threes, which again, might go back to coaching because I know that's how Missoula likes to play is this real live by the three, die by the three type of philosophy. 
um, where I think Jason Tatum could probably get downhill more and use his length to draw fouls or finish with, you know, through contact at the rim, which um, I would like to see more out of him, you know, moving forward. But, you know, like you said, they just, they can't afford to get off to these slow starts against a team in the Sixers where um, Embiid played like the MVP tonight on both ends of the floor, showed why, um, you know, not only him being the leading scorer in the league was huge, but he's one of the best defensive players in the league. Um, had a huge chase down block there, which swung a lot of momentum there. I think it was in the third quarter or early in the fourth quarter. Um, and, and immediately got a bucket off of that. So a four-point swing there for him by himself. So, um, yeah, Sixers team is, is one game away from the Eastern Conference Finals, looking like they're on a crash course to have a Joel versus Jimmy Eastern Conference Finals. Um, just all of them, you can't go wrong with any of these matchups, but that one is going to be, again, another one where it's like, it's going to be gritty. It's going to be physical. There's going to be a lot of yapping on the court. Oh, yeah. Um, PJ Tucker, again, is, is going to be there. He's going to be running his mouth hard. And, like, there's just a lot um, to be excited about if that's, again, the series that we get the way that, that both of these Eastern Conference series are trending in the second round. Um, Real quick, just to go back a little bit, how much do you feel like Tatum's struggles are based on the way the offense is run? Because when I, when I see – the Celtics play right. It just seems like, and I'm I, ha, I would have to go back and look last year to see if under Ime Udoka was it different. But it just seemed like the offense is Tatum ISO drive and kick. Which don't get me wrong, they're getting open looks. They're just like Al Horford was getting a lot of wide open shots. He just wasn't hitting. Yeah. A lot of these shooters are getting open looks. They just wasn't hitting. To Tatum's credit, he is making. I feel like he's making good decisions, like out of the driving kicks for mm-hmm. the most part. But like. It just seems like a real ISO centric offense to where like it's just one on one. Tatum's just gonna go, and most of the time it's Tatum because, like I said, Jalen Brown gets it going in the first quarter, but after that it's just the Tatum show. It seems like so. How much do you feel like his struggles are based off of the way the offense is run, or maybe the way the team is coached? I, I think that's definitely a part of it. Um, I, I think that goes back to what I said earlier about him not getting downhill or looking to get to the basket as much because so much of their offense is right, like almost like five out, like five shooters on the floor and once you get that drive and kick it's a lot of swing 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 like good shot to great shot looking for an open three um which like i said you live by three you die by three and if these shots aren't falling it's gonna get ugly um and and you saw that in this game exactly so i I think it's probably a a little bit more to do with coaching and you know missoula's philosophy there on an offensive perspective which I'll give it time. Like, again, this is his first year, first time ever being a head coach. Um, so we'll see how that kind of adjusts, you know, later in the series, if they're able to extend it further out of, you know, past game six. But, um, you know, just moving forward as a coach for the Celtics, like, I, I think he needs to kind of unlock the two of them a little bit more and not be so rigid on, you know, this perimeter centric three point focused offense. Because, again, two of the best two-way players, two of the best wings, two of the more dynamic scores um, of the basketball in the league are on your team. And a lot of times, again, it feels like they're relegated to watching one of them work at a time. Um, and and so, so much of the ball is about – there's so much of their, their game is around shooting threes and playing around the perimeter where uh, they could be a little bit more um, – a little bit more dominant with their, their driving and, and scoring on the inside. Yeah, I understand. And um, also, by the way, too, I just – I feel like a lot of people – not saying you were doing this at all, but I feel like a lot of people were are counting out the Celtics now, too, because a lot of people are kind of looking forward to the, the Sixers and Heat matchup. I'm still not counting out the Celtics team. I feel like they play their best when their backs are against the wall. And right now, that's exactly what it is on the road in the game six elimination game. I'm definitely not counting out the Celtics. I still feel like they have a decent chance to to win this series. No, I agree. I think, like, looking at, like, comparing it to, like, the Knicks-Heat series, that's a series where I feel like I would be stunned if the Knicks right. were able to do that. And obviously, it's different being down 3-1 versus 3-2. But mm. um, I, the Celtics are not completely out of this series. I honestly just have confidence that going back to Philly, Joel is now, like, one game away from reaching his first conference finals we're in for something, right? Like, there's no way I feel like he lets that one slip through his hands. But mm-hmm. Celtics also were in this position last year against the Bucks, down 3-2, going to Milwaukee for game six. 
Exactly. And that was when Jason Tatum had one of his best performances of the playoffs last year. So, so to your point, they're definitely not out of it by any means. They play some of their best basketball in this position. And we've seen them in this position last year. So it's definitely not a, a freebie for the Sixers to win game six or a potential game seven. Um, but I, I just think Joel is, has got to be able to seize that moment. I feel like all the momentum is going his way. He's able to go in a pivotal game five, have a huge performance. And now I feel like he can see, right, like if he can get game six at home and feel like he's finally going to be in the conference finals. And just like now he's starting to get to that position where it's like, dang, four more and I'm in the finals. It's mm-hmm. like you're having this story kind of season, like you've already got the MVP. Like it just feels like everything is trending that way. And um, just the player that he is and the – I feel like the moment that's it's building up to be, he can he can seize the opportunity. Yeah, I definitely agree. I feel like you're gonna you're gonna get a really good game out of Joel Embiid, but I just I at the bare minimum, I feel like this will be a really really good game. So I feel like the Celtics will know obviously their backs are against the wall. This is an elimination mm-hmm. game. Even if the Sixers end up winning, I think we're gonna be in for a like a real a real great game in Game Six. So yeah, I just. Can't count out the Celtics, man. We can't count out the Celtics because same way Tatum, like you said, starts 0 for 8. The next game, he could start 8 for 8 and go off for 45 points and then push this to a game seven. So, uh, look, I hope so. I hope so. Tatum is one of my favorite players to watch. So, I'd like to see him get off to a good start and have a complete wire to wire, you know, good game. And I'd like to see them push it to a game seven. Who doesn't want to watch a game seven? I'm right. unbiased here, right? Like, <laughs> I would love more basketball between these two teams because right. I think that they still match up well. I think that um, even the games that Harden has gone off in, they've been tight games down the wire, one of them going to overtime. Um, and then game one, he obviously had to hit the game winner. So it's like they've – it's been a relatively tight series, um, even in the games that the Sixers have won. So um, I, like, I'd love to see more basketball regardless. I just – I don't know. I just feel like Joel's got to close it out. It feels like that's – that's his time to, to get that done and get that notch on his belt. That like, okay, he's in a conference final. Cause I know that's what a lot of people have held over his head. And he seems like a guy who listens to that outside noise and definitely knows 100%. what people are saying about him. 100%. So that would go a long way in like getting people to shut up. You can't just talk about, well, Oh, he's never made it out of the second round. Well, now he has the opportunity to go ahead and do that. Um, Transitioning to his center counterpart, who is looking to get the same thing done and, and get to the conference finals for the, I think the second time in his career. Mm-hmm. Um, Nuggets are one game away. The, the Suns went and they defended home court off of video game <laughs> numbers from Devin Booker <laughs> in, in game three and four. I think his, he shot 20 for 25 in game three. And then in game four, he shot – let me pull that up. Because I just cannot believe these numbers look fake. Bro, 20 it, for, it, it, go ahead, go 20 ahead. for 25 in game three and 14 for 18 in game four. He missed nine shots in two games. Bro, that is ridiculous efficiency on the type of shots that he's shooting. He's not Giannis where he's getting to the rim and laying the – bro, he's shooting tough. Contested mid-range shots. He's shooting three. Like he's shoot. He's a jump shooter. Like mm-hmm. this type of efficiency with this volume is just ridiculous. It's insane. It is honestly insane. All credit to Devin Booker, honestly. Yeah, he's been like I I think probably he's been the best playoff performer, just with the way that Jimmy's kind of cooled off a little bit. Obviously he has an injury, but um even going back to the, the first round against the Clippers, he's been putting up hyper-efficient, high-volume scoring games back to back to back to back. You know, games where their back is against the wall. They don't want to go down 3-1. You know, he comes out um, and has a third. Him and KD both have 36 points um, in game four. Huge game for the Suns to, to even up the series. Um, that game, Jokic also had 50 three yeah. points <laughs> 53 points with 11 assists man <laughs> he is i like i'm very confident in saying this is the weirdest 
type of unguardable I think we've ever seen in NBA history because it's not <laughs> like a guy like Shaq or you know Hakeem or Kareem or any of the like dominant bigs that we've seen on offense in the past who dominate with like force or size but it's also not like a big man who's dominated with finesse like dirt and it's not like a guard who like is scoring at the perimeter it's like this a mix of all of them right it's, like <laughs> it's a mix of weird all of them. ugly but beautiful mix of like force and finesse and these like but with no orders in this fadeaway and a bunch of set shots <laughs> like <laughs> um but yeah he put up an unbelievable performance in a loss in game four um as as efficient as Devin Booker has been that is how Jokic has played this entire season and has his career especially since he's you know really transformed to this MVP level player is he is a hyper efficient scorer 20 for 30 from the field 11 of 13 from the free throw line two of four from three in this game um and again we already said 53 points Huge buckets for them. He was keeping them in as much as he absolutely could. Um, rough shooting night for Michael Porter Jr. in that game, four for 13 from three. Um, again, role players typically always play better at home. This was also the Landry Shamit game. So before the Lonnie Walker game even happened, we had the Landry Shamit game. He we had did. 19 points in this game, five for eight from three. Um, a ton of huge threes for them down the stretch. Again, and this has been the story this entire series. When the Suns bench has come to play, they've won games. When you just get that little extra needed boost, a few more points, because you know you're almost, can, you say you can pencil in star players to get X amount of points. It's felt like you could pencil in D-Book and KD for like 80, right? Where can we get the other 30 to 40 points from, from everybody on the team? In this game, they got basically 20 from Shamit. Um, just, just a couple of buckets from everybody else, and that was enough to win this game by five. So, you know, got to tip your cap, cap again here to, to Shamit. Um, and Monty Williams, again, switching up who he was giving a lot of these bench minutes to, bringing in a couple of guys who are um, better at shooting, better at scoring. I mean, that's been huge for them to, to get this two-game – that two-game homestand there in Phoenix. But they did play last night, and completely different story for Michael Porter Jr. in this game. He got out – firing early mm -hmm. and that put the Suns in a very early hole and finished the game with 19 points seven of 11, seven of 11 from the field five of eight from three um when he has his shot falling that I feel like makes this Nuggets team so hard to guard because again like on top of everything else you can get in isolation from Jamal Murray top of what you can get from down low from Jokic from their two man game from Jokic working from handoffs facilitating from the free throw line from the post from the paint and then it's like here comes Michael Porter Jr with four foot threes Aaron Gordon scoring a couple threes and it's like an avalanche of points mm -hmm. coupled with really good defense on the other side of the ball again Aaron Gordon I think has done a phenomenal job this series at yeah, just making Kevin Durant uncomfortable. He had another really slow start to this game. An inefficient game by NBA standards. Super inefficient for, for Kevin Durant standards. 10 for 23 from the field. Didn't make a three in this game. Um, Devin Booker had a significantly lower scoring night than he's had for most of the series. He was held to eight for 19 in this game. Um, video game numbers starting to cool off for him a little bit. Um, that Denver crowd was was rowdy. I know they got chippy with each other on the court for the second time in the series. Uh, we had owners going at it with, with Jokic <laughs> thinking that they were yeah. six man or something. I don't know what it right. was about. Um, but, yeah, the, the Nuggets go out, defend their home court, and now they're going to go back to Phoenix for game six with the opportunity to, to close this one out. Cannot count out D. Book or Kevin Durant because, again, in a one-game scenario – but they're back against the wall. Like, what is there to lose? Either one of them can go for 50 plus. The both of them might go for 50 plus. I don't know. Like, it's mm -hmm. the scoring that we've seen out of the two of them um, has been unreal this entire series and their, this entire playoff run. But it's always going to be on the others. And, you know, their, their bench points last night while the game was tight is not going to cut it. 
um, where you have Bruce Brown dropping 25 off of the off the bench for the Nuggets and providing great defense on the other end. Christian Brom has been great on defense for the Nuggets as well. Um, huge on the point of attack for, for them. So I, I think that the opportunity is there for the Nuggets to, to go to Phoenix and close this one out. You know, even with, you know, Devin Booker and KD, again, I can probably pencil them both in for putting up huge numbers. But, again, it's always just going to come down to what the role players can do. Um, so I still, again, going back to my initial pick, have the Nuggets in this series, but would not be shocked if they were able to, to, to go to Phoenix and get it done here in game six and just kind of close out this, this series here. Yeah, you basically said it, right? The the bench points are going to be the key for the Suns moving forward to win any games in this series or if they get out of the series moving forward. Like you said, they're going to get 30 points from Booker, 30 points from Kevin Durant. They're going to combine. They're going to have a great game. Um, But when you get nothing from your bench, it's it's tough to win. It's hard to win. It's hard to win with two players unless they he goes for like 45, something crazy like that, like yeah. he's been doing. But you've seen in this game that they lost, I mean, 28 is a good, 28 points is a good game, but it seems like for this team specifically, you need them to go for like 30 a piece, 35 plus, just for them to even have a chance. So right, that, and that's why it's tough with the Sun because they <clears throat> they lack so much depth that even a good game from Booker, like a normal good game as far as like NBA standards, a 28 point game, seems like it just wouldn't be enough. Like you need one of them to go absolutely nuclear, and the other person to have just a regular good game as far as NBA standards. So. It's it's tough, um, especially when, like you said, Bruce Brown gets twenty five points off the bench for the Nuggets. Yeah, it's it's tough um, when you have the Denver bench at least giving them something. Like you said, Michael Porter Jr. finally showed up, finally had a good game. Jokic doing his thing, obviously Jamal Murray doing his thing. This Nuggets team is just too deep, in my opinion, for the Suns. So, like I said, when when the Suns star players don't go nuclear, I don't really see a way that they can actually that they can win these series. But like you said, going back to Phoenix for this next game, it is a possibility that you get someone from the bench to step up because, like, we've always talked about bench players play way better at home than mm-hmm. they do on the road. So it's definitely a possibility. Maybe you can get a couple threes from – I'm not saying Landry Shamer's going to hit four or five threes in the fourth quarter again, but if you get a couple threes here and there from this guy, a couple threes here and there from Terrence Ross, just, just little scoring from everyone. It doesn't need to be, well, this person has 12, this person has 14. Just if this person can give me – seven if this person can give me two threes here this person give me a couple threes here and you have Devin Booker and KD going off then I could see a world where they possibly win this game and then force it back to Denver but it's definitely going to be tough right now I feel like I would probably pick Denver I think that I think that they close it out here just because like you said Devin Booker is hopefully cooling off a little bit if you're a Nuggets fan and not every single shot he shoots going is going in the basket so if he can come down to earth a little bit, Kevin Durant continues his struggles, which has been, I don't know, it's been, it's been really interesting to see Kevin Durant struggle this bad. It's like, mm-hmm. besides the, the Boston series, you're not really used to Kevin Durant being so inefficient as far as, like, his standards and the way he plays, so. Yeah, and I feel like even going back to that Boston series last year where he was with Brooklyn, so much of that came from not even just inefficiency, but it felt like they were just, like, taking away his ability to shoot, and he was – like not attempting shots, like they were sending doubles, they were ma- like forcing anybody else on the nets to score. He's getting the shots up, and a lot of them are not the worst looks for Kevin Durant. Obviously, again, like I said, Aaron Gordon is making it as difficult as he can with his length, but they're just not dropping. And again, I think some of that has to be filling out of his rhythm. Like he's such a player that feels like he's always in like a flow state when he's on the court. Like he doesn't feel like he can be rattled or phased. Feels like that's got to kind of be what's happening here, um, you know, in this series, just with how much, like the last two games he's gotten off to, in multiple games in the series, really, he's gotten off to really bad starts um, and finished with definitely subpar efficiency numbers as a whole, but definitely for for Kevin Durant, um, you know, in his career. Yeah, 100%. Um, stuff. <laughs> Our boy actually had a pretty decent game, DeAndre, and at least – that's did you crazy. did you see how he was scoring though? Like I don't want to keep getting on his case, but it's just like it's always like these floaters and push shots. I know it's, it's like there's not even anybody <laughs> in front of you go like dunk the ball, lay like get to the rim. Everything feels so 
up and up. Like, That's why I say he's so soft. Everything is I, it's nice to have a little touch as a big man, but it's like at some point I need you to be a big man and go to the basket and try to dunk the basketball or at least be aggressive. He's All of his pulling points, it out when he doesn't need to. It's like right. there's no one in front of you and you're still hitting like a little touch shot. Like <laughs> just take one step and dunk it or just give me a little finger roll or something. It, everything does not need to be so much finesse. Did you see the uh, – somebody basically I, – I remember it was a video dude was talking about how coming out of Arizona, he said he didn't want to be a center. Like, he was a power forward on purpose. Kind of like how AD was, you know, he does oh. But honestly, when I think about it, him and AD are the same person. AD is just way better. <laughs> <laughs> they have the same mindset sometimes. But they say he um he didn't want to be a center. Like, he prefers to play the power forward. Like, he doesn't like banging down low. Like, his preferred position is power forward. But, yeah. In today's NBA, that's not happening. Like, you're not You versatile. can't have to. You don't no. shoot. It can't happen. It, yeah, you're not versatile enough, bro. It's, it's not going to happen. Unless you got the flamethrower in your back pocket. You've been waiting to, to let it go. But Who knows? You're not going to play. You see what happens when you put you put two seven-footers together and one of them can shoot. It didn't look good in Minnesota. So Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, so. I don't think that's going to that's gonna change anything. I think the Suns are a team that – they want a center like Nicholas Claxton or Jared Allen or like a Zubac, Looney. somebody, right, Looney, somebody that'll just get rebounds, you know, be an interior presence on both sides of the ball. And that's it, the role. They don't want somebody that's going to need post touches and face ups. Like that's not how their offense is predicated, which is why right. I was confused as to why they re signed him. Like, after everything that had transpired previously, like they had this super embarrassing elimination to Dallas last year, Aiton had issues in that series on the court and then off the court with Monty, clearly. Um, and then like the Pacers looked to sign him and they matched the offer sheet when they could have just signed him the year prior than that. It so made it's no like sense. Just creating unnecessary drama. And it, it just seems like he doesn't fit what this roster not necessarily needs, but how they want to play basketball under Monty Williams, Aiton doesn't seem like the fit there. Mm -hmm. So if, I, I it's, it's puzzling. I, I really don't get it. If they end up losing this series, it's going to be an interesting conversation at, on the next pod as to what they do moving forward as far as like trying to build a real roster with this team. Because right now they – They're kind they of tied. To it, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's it's tough because they need real role players. Like this, this whole KD and Booker is gonna carry us every night. Ah, uh, this isn't really sustainable. I don't see it working. It might win you some regular season games, but comes down to the postseason and teams play you every other night and they're preparing for you every single night. I don't I don't see a world where they can go on a deep playoff run playing like this. Yeah, uh, I I cannot imagine. D book having better games than he had in game two and game three. And that's not sustainable. And if you're right. saying that you're like, this is the roster that you're going to roll with. Like, where do y'all go from here to get better? And Chris Paul is getting older and older and just that more contract injuries. is getting bigger and bigger. Also, right. Which there is, is what, like when he got signed to that deal, like that's what everybody knew it was. Like if he declines in age, then it's like, okay, the first two years of this deal are going to be, it's still a lot of money, but it's Chris Paul, and like that's our window. Because if that decline kicks in, which you know, unfortunately, it feels like it inevitably has for Chris Paul, as it has his whole career, like he cannot stay healthy in the postseason. Um, then it's like you're spending all this money on your point guard, older, can't play, slower pace. You now locked into a huge deal with Kevin Durant. You've traded away a lot of draft capital to get him traded away your depth to get him. So barring retooling around vets, like, again, this team is really tied. Aiton is now on a max type of contract, a big deal. So I, I, I don't know what, what they can do other than just be like, I don't know, D-Book, I need 15 more. I don't know, KD, I need 15 more. Like, that's all that you have right? really for this, this roster. So, look, like I said, we're going to game six. Anything can happen with, you know, the duo of KD and D-Book, but that's uh, – that's, 
It's not it's looking good. Yeah, it's a, that's a, a big ask for the both of them. I genuinely think, like, they would have to have another, like, combined for 90 <laughs> type of game to go um, and, and win game six in, in Phoenix. Again, even on the road, like, Denver is another team that – this is, I think, again, I mentioned before, this is probably the best roster that Jokic has had put around him. Um, Easily. They gotta know it's blood in the water. It's looking like we're probably gonna get the Lakers coming out of this. We need to get this done now because it's three one in that series. The Lakers are able to close something out quick. You do not want to give anybody on that team any additional rest, especially coming off a series where they're already are playing every other day. Like mm-hmm. those are the, these are the type of games that make huge differences in postseason for like well-coached veteran teams because that one or two extra days of rest is huge in the long run when you're grueling for seven games, seven games, seven game series is back to back to back, you know, um, and, and looking to make that finals run. So you see, I got the, the Denver shirt on. I think that they're going to be able to close it out in game six, but um, yeah, the Okich, Murray, Michael Porter Jr. They, you know, get it going, the three of them, that's going to be a tough task regardless of how many points KD and D. They can combine for 110. It might not be enough, you know, so. They play tomorrow? Um, I think so. They might have an extra day off because of, uh, whatchamacallit, because it's uh, they're going to Phoenix. I think they do. Yeah, they play on, they play on Thursday. Play on Thursday. So if they were to lose that game, they would play when Sunday? Probably, yeah. They probably get another two days off. Okay. All right. Yeah, they better hope because the Lakers is coming. The Lakers is coming. Nah, forget that. We win it tonight, bro. Forget that. We win it tonight. There's no way. It's no (laughs) way. (laughs) Y'all would have to have the greatest performance out of, like, (laughs) <laughs> someone y'all, y'all, it would be like I don't know the Wendy and Gabriel for... game or something yeah <laughs> it had to be so, some crazy anomaly would have to happen because <laughs> Steph is going for minimum like 40 35 Steph or 40 gonna, Steph is going to go off Clay's going to have a bounce back Jordan Poole might hit a couple three like they're just going to play so out of body bro it's going to be so annoying to watch I'm actually yeah. it's going to be so I'm going to be pissed tonight I already know I'm very skeptical that series can go seven just off of the strength that you're going to get game five in Golden State. Um, and that's game six. We know what game six Clay do. Game we know what game Clay. six Clay do. Vando, lock that up, bro. Put Vando on Clay, lock that up, bro. We, we, I'm not going for none of that game six stuff, bro. I can't. I can't. I can see it now. Oh, my God. Why would you put that image in my head, Billy? Oh, uh, I just hear Clay for three. Dang. And they're on a 10 0 run. Oh my God, bro. Oh, bro. oh that's going to be pain. I just got it from Wolves right now. I seen a report earlier today that the Raptors were interested in looking at JJ Reddick for a coaching decision or for their coaching vacancy. I, based on what I heard from JJ Reddick, it didn't seem like <laughs> that's something that he would really be interested in, especially like he taking up such a big role on the you know, the media front in the past couple of years, but he went and interviewed for the job today. It's just a, you know, large first round, you know, type of interview. So they're interviewing a lot of people, but that would be, that would be interesting to see JJ Reddick as a coach. I think he literally was just talking to Jamal Crawford about um, if Jamal Crawford would ever be coaching the NBA and, you know, Jamal Crawford was like, absolutely not. You know, he's coaching his, I think, an AAU team. J.J. Reddick coaches his son's basketball team. They're all, like, eight or nine years old. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I, I couldn't imagine him being a, a head coach, but Raptors are, are looking at him for it. That'd be interesting for sure. Yeah, that'd be really interesting. Like, when you hear J.J. talk about basketball, it's it's clear and obvious he knows what he's talking about. It's mm-hmm. obvious that he's – it's funny, too, because he's – bro, when I, watch, when I watch him on first take, especially funny on first take because, you know, like, the, the media outlets aren't necessarily – they don't really – analyze the game so it's funny hearing like the like a a a different view on it basically when he talks about like analytics advanced stats like he brought up Mm -hmm. some stat bro and i was like well that is like the most like nerdiest technical stat ever it was like he'd be using second spectrum 
because they yeah. have they got the cameras up in the, the rafters of each arena, mm-hmm. so they track players with that. So he he gets some wild stats for sure. Bro, it was like Jamal Murray this series is averaging like 0.5 more second on the ball. Like I was like, bro, respect, bro. Cause I I'm sorry. You're not getting that hit. Maybe Billy might tap into that. I'm sorry, I'm not looking into that. That's too much. But it's it's clear and obvious that he knows what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, very knowledgeable about the game. I love hearing him talk about basketball, like especially for someone who obviously never played in the NBA. Like it's good to get that insight on yeah. certain stuff. So I mean, it'd be interesting. I don't know if he can coach. None of us are going to know he can coach. But them role players who, like, were role players in their day, they turn out to be some pretty good coaches. So, you yeah. don't know. He he could possibly be a pretty good coach. We don't know. Can't be worse than Steve Nash, so. <laughs> so that's, Bro, a wild, listen, that's a wild I'm, stray. Oh, <laughs> oh, but nah, bro, if you, listen, if you made an all-star team, I don't want you as my coach. If you were an if if you were an MVP, I definitely don't want you off my coach. Like people are talking about, uh, I I, I feel bad because I keep bringing stuff up to like the Lakers, but technically it's not about the Lakers. It's just a LeBron thing. Like people are saying, like when he's retired, he's gonna be a great coach because you know how he makes all those like in game adjustments and tells people what to do. Bro, when you are like the best of the best, bro, you I, most of the time you can't be a good coach. Like mm-hmm. when Magic Johnson tried, he stunk. Like. Most of the time, when you're the best of the best, you can you don't coaching doesn't really work out in your favor. So, but them yeah. them role players, they turn out to be some pretty good coaches. The only coach right now that I would say was really a like top tier player when they were in the league is Chauncey Billups. He was a good coach. Yes, you're right. And look, and he, this is his first year, so like, I got to see more. But and the roster is. I I can't even really gauge him as a coach based on what they got out there in Portland right now. Um, mm-hmm. But other than that, right, like even the ones that were like notable players, like I actually I can't even say that because I forgot about Jason Kidd. That's crazy. I don't think Jason Kidd is a good coach though. And I so like I thought he had a better stint this year. It was bad. I'm not gonna lie. This year was bad. I feel like he had a better stint the second time around. Like, because when he played, when he coached the Nets, he was terrible. And then... He was bad at second... Milwaukee, too. He did coach Milwaukee. All right, never mind. I, I take everything I just said back. Never mind. I forgot, he coached, I forgot he coached Milwaukee. Obviously, I think some of it is this past year, like, you lose <clears throat> Jalen Brunson. That's tough. The roster construction is not great. Like, the, the Mavericks have tons of problems outside of Jason Kidd, but I don't think Jason Kidd is a great coach. Um, So, yeah, that... Look, that holds up because some of the better ones were role guys, Steve Kerr, Darvin Ham, Jamal Mosley. Um, so yeah, that definitely definitely holds up. Phil Jackson back in the day, Doc Rivers, yeah, like, another it one. keeps going on and on. Steve Kerr, like those co- those players that were just role players, they're all not always, I'm not gonna say that, but they tend to work out a, a good amount of the time. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Also found out recently, uh, Tom Thibodeau played D three basketball way back in the day. Bro was a six two power forward. He was probably like, out like Pat Bev out there. Nah, bro, he was, gritty. He was putting up like 24, 25 a game. Okay, I didn't even know that. Okay. They asked Emmanuel quickly. They was like, "What position did he play?" He was like, "He didn't play." He was like, "He was like, no, yeah, he did." <laughs> He's like, it was like a multiple choice question. He was like, he, bro, he's like six two. It was like, no way he played power forward. And he was like, he did. Was like, how many points he put up? And it was like 25, 13, nine, or like five. He was like, it's no way he put up 25. He's like, he got like 13. It was like, no, bro, he put up like 25 a game. Let me find out Tibbs get like that. <laughs> six two power forward, put up 25 a game. What, how you even scoring? That's crazy. I was about to say, like, who's guarding you? What? Like, how know. does that? How is that working? He was out there like Bruce Brown when he was on the Nets. Out right. there, point guard playing center. That's what it was. <laughs> Off the short roll, going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, since we last recorded, um, all rookie and all defensive teams have come out. I think all NBA teams come out tonight. Um, so Ooh. we'll be able to touch on those in the next pod. But all rookie first team, no surprises here. Um, Paolo Bencaro, Walker Kessler. J-Dub with the Thunder, Keegan Murray, um, and Benedict Matherin. 
Second team, we got Jeremy Sohan, Jabari Smith, Jaden Ivey, Tari Eason, and Jalen Duran out in Detroit. Um, I think all of those make sense. Uh, the final voting, I think the closest one, you know, being swapped from uh, first team to second team was Benedict Matherin. I think I've seen people, a lot of people thought maybe Jaden Ivey could have could have slid for that first team spot instead. But either way, I think, um, again, everybody on that team is well-deserving. I don't have anybody off differently that I would have put on. Um, but, uh, you know, huge, huge congrats to guys like, um, you know, Keegan Murray, especially like who, you know, fourth pick in the draft, went mm -hmm. to a team and was mm -hmm. able to like slot in and play a huge role for him in the regular season and elevated that into the postseason. So really excited to see what he's going to do moving forward. Um, Paolo, the clear cut, one of the best rookie starts I feel like we've seen in a while. I feel like even that is going underrated right. um, just by how how poised he looks for the, being his first year in the league. Jay Dubs was huge for Thunder. Walker Kessler is better than Rudy Gobert. <laughs> um, and, and Benedict Matherin, again, in, in Indiana. Him and, and you know, Tyrese Halliburton, I think, are going to be a nice little one-two punch for them. So, now we talked about last time, man, the future's looking bright. The future's looking real bright in the NBA. 100%. Shout out to Jabari Smith, too, because uh, had kind of had a somewhat of a slow start to the year, mm -hmm. picked it up a little bit later. So shout out to him for – because I know he was getting a lot of – a lot of slack, a lot of slack for his slow start. Basically, people questioning why they took him so early or questioning why was he worth his pick, but played well later in the year. So, yeah, shout out to pretty much all these rookies, man. Shout out to all these rookies. Jalen Williams, my my OKC Thunder. We, we looking <laughs> real good. We looking real good. And, uh, yeah, Rockets, Rockets slid two on that team. Tari Eason was huge from the, from the get-go for the Rockets, um, mm -hmm. and especially on the defensive side of the ball. He played a lot of big impact minutes for them, and with Ime being there, man, I think he's going to take his game to the next level. Um, right. So excited to see how, how he progresses. Moving to the all-defensive teams. Um, I have a little bit of – little gripes with this one, but nothing too many. <clears throat> just the reality of how these awards are voted on, especially – the defensive one may be the most vague out of all of them because different people have different opinions on what even is a good defender, what makes good defense. So – First team, we got Alex Caruso, Drew Holiday, um, and then the three, uh, the three headed monster of who was, you know, the, the running for def defensive player of the year, and Jaron Jackson mm -hmm. Jr., Brooke Lopez, and Evan Mobley. And on the second team, we got Bam Adebayo, OG Ananobi, Dylan Brooks, Draymond Green, and Derek White. Um, I'm honestly kind of shocked there was no Jaden McDaniels. I thought for sure he would have made a defensive team. I know people, I'm pretty sure I looked at the the voting. Um, there were people that had him on their first team ballot, I think. So I was mm -hmm. surprised that he didn't make the team at all. Um, personally, I would have had him over um, a guy like Dylan Brooks, but then I looked back and I think Dylan Brooks actually made it as a guard, which is interesting. Uh, the, He's not a guard though. The positions don't be making sense. Like, um, it's so, bro, that's so weird. Like, that stuff is so weird. Like, even with the all NBA stuff, like, you know, the one thing that pisses me off about these awards is the fact that you could vote for players at different positions. So, like, I guess it changed now because they changed the way they're voting for it. But, like, a lot of the problem was the fact that they would vote certain people in positions that they're not. Like, I remember, I was, I forgot who it was. I think it was Chris Boussard because he has a vote for, like, the NBA stuff. And, like last year, he voted for like Nikola Jokic at center for first team All NBA, but like Joel Embiid at power forward, even though he's not a power forward. But it like splits the votes, and then he ends up not making it. Like the votes don't really count as as much. So it's like the voting is so weird for all. It needs these to awards. get positionless for for all of the all the awards. Like for All NBA, let's just pick the fifteen best players. Right. If there are four centers that are within the that had the 15 best seasons, there should be able to be four centers on the all-NBA Exactly. Mm -hmm. If there's five centers that are the best defenders in the NBA, there should just be five centers. Because, again, it's tough that Nick Claxton doesn't even get on this all-defensive team. He was in the DPOY race for most of the first half of the year. Mm -hmm. um, and there's just – it's no slot for him, right, because it's just – you have Brooke already, and then 
you know, Bam is on the second team. And so it's like, I can't, yeah. I'm, I wouldn't not necessarily take either of those guys off. They're both well-deserving. I just also wish Nick, Nick Claxton could get, you know, some recognition for the season that he had on the defensive side of the ball out there in Brooklyn. Um, but yeah, Dylan Brooks, I don't know. I feel like he, like, their starting lineup was Ja and Desmond Bain. And Dylan he was Brooks never a guard. Three. So how, I don't know how the criteria works. I don't know if there's a certain number of minutes you have to log at a position to get, you know, being able to be listed. They had a year where uh, DeMar DeRozan made all NBA right last year um, as a, a guard. And he played, like, he literally played the four for them for most right. of the entire last season. So, but it's so, it's so position. weird. It's a whole, it just, it, it makes the voting more complicated than it already is. Because like I said, for all NBA and especially all defensive teams, like what is the criteria, right? Cause like, I know for a fact, right, a lot of the people that vote on these awards, like, some of them are local beat writers. Like, nobody's watching every single game or everybody's going to have different opinions. But so, like, when they go to stats, it's like, okay, maybe we're looking at defensive rating. Like, that's not an individual stat. There are people that have really good defensive ratings, like Jokic, who I would not say is an elite defender. Um, so that – I think like just the way that these awards are voted on and some of the criteria, like the reality of it is, it's always going to be kind of weird with some of the outcomes, but the positions are making it more complex than it needs to be. Either take away positions completely or one assign everyone their position. Like what is their position? I don't like the fact that you can vote people at a guard and at a forward because it like just messes up their chances of making it on either because you're splitting the votes. Like it's just, it makes no sense to me. And like you said, the criteria doesn't make sense. We don't know what the criteria is, but that's like with every, pretty much all the award. That's like with MVP, like the, the criteria for that changes pretty much every single year. Like it could be the best player on the best team. It could be the guy that did something different. Like when Russell Westbrook won it as a six seed, just because he had a great, you know, he, he averaged triple double, all that stuff. The The criteria for these awards these all NBA awards, these MVPs, all this stuff changes every single year. And it's just, yeah. it's kind of annoying because it's like, we don't know, we don't know what the criteria is, basically. It changes all the time. So, yeah, it's uh, definitely needs a little bit of a change. I'm curious to see how it's going to work now that they changed it. Because mm -hmm. what they changed, did they change it to positionless now or what did they change it to? It's not positionless, but now there's more requirements. It's like you have to play 65 oh, yeah, yeah. games. I think, mm -hmm. the, and then like there's some weird like you can um, like appeal if you only played like 60 games or like you were genuinely hurt or something like that. Like there's like they made it so like you can still jump through some hoops to get, you know, eligible for some of the end of season awards. But um I, I, I think nothing is going to change that drastically until, again, they make it positionless because the way that the league is trending is like positions are mattering less and less. So like, we don't need to get so rigid on these awards. Like even how they do all-star voting is starting to get more positionless. And it's been that way. Like you have backcourt and frontcourt spots. So like, why is it that we can't get to that level on all NBA awards or all defensive teams as well? Right. Um, yeah. Also got a shout out. Um, Herb Jones, I think he definitely had a case to make one of the all defensive teams this year. He did. Um, had a phenomenal year out there in, in New Orleans. Um, I think it may just be a minutes thing, right? Like he just doesn't play as many minutes as some of these other guys do on their, their respective teams just because his role on the team isn't as big. But, um, you know, one of the best perimeter defenders in the league, you know, great length out there. He's going to continue to get better. Um, he's going to be a perennial all defensive team guy. I thought he might have got his first nod this year, but. Again, like I said, it's only 10 slots, um, and you're going to have guys that, you know, people are going to say we're snubbed. At the end of the day, I think everybody that made the list is deserving, you know, even whatever you want to think about Dylan Brooks. At the end of the day, he is a quality defender, was a huge part of their defense for years now in Memphis and, you know, made a huge impact there um, this past season. So well-deserved for him on that front. I just – I don't know how he was able to slide in there as a guard. That's my only gripe with it. But not going to say that he's not deserving of – making the team because of that. And more people need to realize that too, that the fact that, like you said, there's only 10 slots, like your favorite player sometimes is just going to get, especially if it's a conversation. Like, I don't think there's anyone that is like 
this is dumb how they did not make it. Like it's like you can make a case for all these guys that they are deserving of this spot. So people, people need. It. I I see all the time people like complaining about this guy didn't make it. How did this guy not make it? I'm like, bro, it's ten spots, bro. Like it's, it's kind of annoying. Snub. I'm almost gonna call it like snub culture is. It's annoying because they we do it for everything, every award, every team list, like. People are talking about snubs for the all rookie team. Like, how did Andrew ne Andrew Nemhard not make it? I'm like, bro, I come on, bro. What are we talking about right now, bro? They was talking about that for the all star starters. It was like, but how does Joel and B get snubbed from being an all star starter? I'm like, it was Kevin Durant, Jason Tatum, was it Giannis? At and that it's a time, fan vote. it's a fan vote, like right. And at that time, it's like, okay, you take one of those guys off. Now it's how did Jason Tatum not make like bro? It's only three. Spots, you can't please bro, everybody. So like they need to. It needs to get. It needs to get calmed down because, like you said, it's only a select number of slots on any of these end of year teams. Only one person can win any of these end of year awards. Like people are going to get snubbed, right? And you can, like I said, same way I just was able to do it. Like dang, wish they could have. Like Herb Jones could have made. It. I think he did enough to make the team. Wish my like Nick Claxton could have got working out. I think he did enough to make the team. If you sat there and asked me, okay, well, take my off one. I can't because I think they're all deserving of it. At the end of the day, there's only right. 10 slots. I don't have a vote. I can't change that decision. Um, so I can just tip my caps and be like, you know, I think they have phenomenal years from a defensive perspective. I think they did enough to make the team. But at the end of the day, it's only so many slots. If there was a third all-defensive team, I think they both would have made it. But then it's like we're – overwatering that category maybe too much you could say that about anything because like mm. dang why aren't there six all nba teams you know like there's only so many slots to make it um so yeah snub culture is get out of control if your favorite player don't make it they don't mean that they're bad it don't mean that they have you know people aren't watching it's just they can't fit everybody it's just it is what it is bro it's tough yeah we also guard are... up. Tell them guard up better, man. Just tell them lock in better, bro. It's not that hard. It, it, some people also do just need to. Uh, they gotta like you gotta advocate for yourself, which is stupid that that even has to be the case. But like, you see when some people start banging the drum, like, "Oh, I'm really a top tier defender. I'm this. I'm that." Like OG and Anobi was saying that. You see, he made <laughs> all defensive team this year. Uh, right. Not to say that he may not have made it without it, but that definitely matters again when you have the voters being media members who are spread out, some of them are beat writers tied to individual teams. Like they don't have the opportunity to necessarily watch all these teams every given night. Like some fans may able to, who just watch it on league pass. So um, they might not have as good of a view of some of these other players as they might. They may only see them when they come to their specific city. So if that's the case, right? Like it sucks that that's the case, but like if you really are wanting to make some of these teams. You're going to have to start, talking about it, talking to the media about it, you know, being vocal about wanting to be on some of these teams. And that may increase your chances, but we are just over six days from the draft lottery, AKA the Wembenyama sweepstakes. Um, I don't know if you, have you ever heard of Tankathon? Tankathon? Yeah. No, what's, I mean, it's a, it's, I'm assuming it's about tanking, but I don't no, know. It's a, is. it's a website that has a, a draft lottery simulator. Okay. Where, like, they put the, the odds in with all the pick stipulations on. And so ones that are protected, you know, all of the different, you know, sliding scale of odds. So like you can literally just sit up here endlessly and just click slim, sim lottery over and over and over and run it. So I'm about to start doing this every time we run the pod until it ends. Okay. So again, you know, top three odds to get the first pick Detroit, Houston, San Antonio, and then Charlotte and Portland there at the next two round at the bottom five. Portland really slide into the fifth best odds is crazy because they were wow. really fighting for the plan. Um, but yeah, literally all you got to do is hit sim lottery. So I'm going to do it right now. Some of the results be crazy. So if this was the actual lottery, the first overall pick would go to the Magic. Paolo and Wimby. And Franz and Markel. And Markel, folks. That's crazy. Uh, that U Utah would get the second pick. That would be really nice. They could get somebody like Scoot Henderson in there. I, I about to say it's it's Wimby, it's Scoot Henderson. Isn't that guy from Alabama? Isn't he like a top gonna be a top three pick? I am not gonna sit up here and act like I'm a scout. I'm not gonna sit up here and act like I've watched 
you know, bas- college basketball, nowhere near enough to the point to have like super in-depth draft breakdowns. Like I have people that I go to to get my draft knowledge because mm. I do not have the, the time. I cannot keep up with yeah, college I basketball. I don't know any, I, bro. I don't know anything. But if it's not Wimbiana, Scoot Henderson, I'm lost, bro. I don't know. I don't know. But to me, even just like what I've seen, like the little bit of research I've been able to do on the games I was able to watch, like again, obviously Wembenyam is a clear number one. For most of the year, it was like Wemby, Scoot, one, two, easy, no debate. We don't need to think about it. But I feel like this happens every year. Like people got to try to be smarter than they need to be and try to be more strategic than they need to be. And like, I'm seeing people take a Thompson twin second. I've seen people put Brandon Miller second. Like I've seen people drop scoop to four. Like we don't need to overcomplicate things. If it's about fit, then maybe I can understand if it's a team that already has a well-established point guard, like, I don't know, would the Hornets want to put Scoot and LaMelo together? I don't know. That's a different story. Right. But like, we're just talking purely off of talent. Like, from what I've seen from Scoot Henderson, like even just his build, like he is hockey. Like he's built. He's a grown man at right. 18, bro. That's, that's crazy. Like Daz and just why, like his explosiveness, his decision making, like he is a true point guard and he can come into the league and make an impact right away. The same way that Wembenyama could. To me, if Wembenyama wasn't in this draft class, Henderson would easily be the number one overall pick, and that would be by far. Consensus. So, and, and it would still be teams trying to. It wouldn't be as much tanking. I feel like to to get Wimbiama, but yeah. teams would definitely still want that number one overall pick bad to get Scoot Henderson. He's he's a great player from what I've seen. But right. like you, like you said about the draft process, I feel like that happens all the time and with all sports. Like the same thing that just happened with this NFL draft. Like before the draft, like as the season was going on, it was Bryce Young one, C.J. Stroud two. Like that was just consensus then we get to the drive process like the months leading up and it goes from like anthony richardson one will levis one like bro it changed so much and then when it came down to the draft it was price young one right tj Stroud. like it, like i think a lot of that is just like it's just smoke like people is just just talking trying to talk up certain people maybe to get people to trade up and do this and that like trying to manipulate the draft and stuff so i feel like that happens every single year pretty much every sport that i've watched as far as the draft process. Yeah, as a whole, people just you don't got to make it more complicated than it needs to be. Like, you don't – if the eyes don't lie – I said that, like, three different times this episode, but, like, for real, like, the eye test, if it's telling you that Scoot is the second best player, he's the second best player. We don't need to try to do anything extra because one Banyama's in the draft and it's like, oh, we can swap people up and, like, bro, you don't need to do all that. Side note, I I just put up the Tankathon thing. I just did one. Guess who got the first pick? Oh, the Trailblazers, bro. I like because again, it's endless possibilities. Any team in the lottery can get it. I've seen it where the Pelicans have gotten the first pick, bro. like the Thunder. They don't deserve the first pick. Now nah, I think about it. like the Pelicans. No, y'all don't deserve the first pick. No. But look, them them ping pong balls are changing. The Bulls, the like bro, legacy, yeah, change the crazy. whole franchise's legacy, and this year more than ever, um, because it's like I, I, whoever gets the first pick is drafting one Binyamo, or at like if I'm a team like the Thunder or the Jazz, I wouldn't even be pressed if I don't get the first pick. I'm about to throw the most ridiculous trade package in front of that GM. I'm gonna make him say no, like. Mm-hmm. Like bro, you yeah. want how many first round picks you want? I'll give you five, five. I, we, I'll trade our next eight first round picks. It picks what? swaps every year in between. <laughs> what and this low key could be like a little segment. What, what do you think is too much? Like where's like the 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 line as far as not even just picks? Let's talk about like players in the league. What is like the breaking point of like what you would trade for women Yama? That's a good question because I seen someone do a, a Twitter poll and I was not expecting the results to be like that. I think it was NBA University. It's like, which would you rather have? And it was like the first overall pick for Anthony Edwards. And bro, I kid you not, it was like dead even. I the way I seen the poll, I know what you're talking about. And I it's bro, it's so tough though. It's so tough, bro. I'm taking eight, right. ten times out of ten. All right. Listen, I'll play devil's advocate. 
but Wimby could end up being the GOAT, bro. Like, he is <laughs> like, bro, like, like you, you're, seven. you're taking a guy who literally has already shown himself, like, he's on a superstar trajectory, put a team on his back in the postseason, going blow for blow with Memphis last year doing everything he can to not get swept against the one seed this year on a roster that is not constructed around him great. Versus, I, hear you. I, I noticed the ceiling is... <laughs> it's, it, that's, there's no ceiling, bro. It's like, it's to the moon, bro. What did, what did, what did MJ say? Moon. The ceiling is the roof. Like, bro, <laughs> bro there is no stopping the, 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 the potential superstar that he is. And I get all that. But at the end of the day... You're taking a known versus an unknown on top of, like, I don't think it's as big of a deal as people make it from a frame perspective, but anybody over seven foot is just more prone to injuries. Like, that's an NBA fact. So, like, you have to factor that in as well. So, again, as great as the ceiling is, like, that's a high risk to take. And if you could get a guy like Anthony Edwards, I'm taking Anthony Edwards, like no questions asked. <laughs> Unless, again, if you're one of these super low teams that already tanked for him, mm-hmm. now you got to follow through because, like, you're here. And, like, what it would do for your team off the court from, like, a business mm-hmm. perspective, like, we all are going to pack it out the arena every night. Y'all could lose every game. It does not matter. Exactly. It's like a, a spectacle to go see. That's a, that that's the main thing, bro. It is it's more than just his potential, bro. He will literally change your entire franchise. Like you said, like you're gonna boost your local economy. Like <laughs> you're li- li- bro, literally, bro. Literally, bro. Oh my that you know what? That's a, we could play that game on one of these pods. Maybe like closer to the draft. What is it? You said in six days? The draft lottery is in six days. Uh the, oh, the lottery draft is, okay. is in June. Okay, okay. You know, I'll come up with a list of players, and we'll say, "Would you rather this guy or Wimby or the number one?" We'll say the number one pick. Yeah, or basically Wimby Yama. Yeah. That, that could be fun. That could nah, be that'll fun. be good. I, look, I, I'll let you know now. It's I don't know what the cutoff would be, but Anthony Edwards is well above that point. <laughs> he, he's I, it's he's not the line. Like there are probably players uh-huh. a little bit worse than that. I feel like I would maybe take again. Like I said, if you're like a a team like Detroit or you know, uh, the Rockets or something where it's like, why would it, like, you have to take Wimbin Yama at that point because, like, you're already such a young mm-hmm. team. Might as well just add to the young core instead of looking for an established guy. But, like, right. like if for some whatever reason, like, let's say Dallas slid and got the first overall pick, and it's like, oh, but Ant is on the table. Or somebody like that caliber, it's like, oh, I might take Ant because I know what I'm getting versus bringing a young guy. It's like all this talent or all this, you know, talent and potential – um, it's like y'all are kind of at a team that can win now. So, and the question could get real interesting once we, especially when we talk about older players, like even if they're established right now, yeah. if they're mid thirties, not not just not saying you would take him over Kevin Durant, but I'm just saying like an example, like you don't know how many years he has left, LeBron. You, you don't know how many good years he got left. I'm taking one Bayama over LeBron. I, I'm taking one. Yeah. One, yeah. We're going to get into that. We're going to get into, we're gonna get into that. But, yeah. but it, could get, it, it could get real nasty as far as these answers, yeah. bro. That's going to be fun. Yeah, so. Lakers Lakers trade up. We get Wimby. Wimby right, now and we Davis. Now we definitely end the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as always, we appreciate you for tuning in to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe to the video. Uh, Follow us on socials. Follow the TikTok account. um, And and be on the lookout for another pod coming this weekend. Um, And, yeah, anything else you got last minute for for, for, uh, Lakers takes? I don't got nothing to say, bro. I'm going to let our play do the talking Lakers and six. Uh, I'm Billy. That's Dame. And we out. Peace. Yes, sir.